Sometimes in life, one must walk through the dark times to reach the light. While that has nothing to do with this lesson, it seemed a nice melodramatic line to begin. Often in the process of learning, we go through periods that are a struggle, where we just feel as if we're memorizing and spewing knowledge. I hope this is not one of those times, but if it is, remember there's a bigger picture, and soon there will be enough pieces to assemble some sort of coherent picture. At this point, we have the basic concept of a phaser. We know that capacitors and inductors can be represented by impedances under sinusoidal steady-state conditions. We also perform some basic circuit analysis in the phaser domain. There are many simple circuits that come up in circuit modeling on a regular basis. However, we need phaser analysis to be more robust to be completely useful. The most robust method of analysis that we have is node voltage analysis. We know from our previous discussions that this is what circuit analysis simulation programs use. What would it look like for us to analyze a phasor domain circuit using node voltage analysis? We will first look at a circuit in the time domain containing a sinusoidal source and a couple of energy storage devices. I should point out that before we start our analysis, we need to look at the circuit and verify that all of the sources have the same angular frequency before we try to apply phasers. A quick glance at the circuit says that this is the case. We are tasked to determine the time varying voltage across the one kilo ohm resistor. Before we can analyze the circuit, we must take this circuit to the phaser domain. When it comes to the variable that we are looking for, that is simply a matter of rewriting V out of T as a phaser voltage. For future reference, we will take the angular frequency and write it off to the side. Since the source does not have a phase angle, we can rewrite the input voltage as a magnitude with a phase angle of zero degrees. The resistors are already in the phaser domain, since ideal resistors do not have a frequency response. Then we need to convert the capacitance of the 100 picofarad capacitor to an impedance. Remember that the impedance of a capacitor is one over the complex number times the angular frequency times the capacitance. That will result in an impedance of minus j 1.333 kilo ohms. Looking to the inductor, the impedance of an inductor is the complex number times the angular frequency times the inductance. This results in an impedance of j times 410 ohms. With all of our elements converted to the phasor domain, we can start node voltage analysis by identifying the nodes in the circuit. In this case, there are four nodes. I'm gonna select the bottom node for the reference node and define it as zero volts. This makes the upper left-hand node equal to the value of the voltage source. The middle node will be the phasor voltage that we are trying to determine, and just to assign the remaining node a voltage, I will call it V1. Having identified the nodes in the circuit, I'm then going to define the currents through each of the passive elements. For no particular reason, I will define the horizontal currents as going left to right and the vertical currents as going top to bottom. The analysis of the circuit then proceeds exactly as if it consisted entirely of resistors. Looking at the center node, we have the current through the capacitor entering the node. This is written as the voltage of the tail of the current arrow minus the voltage at the head of the current arrow divided by the impedance the current is going through. The remaining two currents of this node leave, and they are the currents through the one kilo ohm resistor, which is the voltage at the center node minus the voltage at the reference node, which is zero volts, divided by one kilo ohm, and the current through the 470 ohm resistor, which is the voltage at the center node minus the voltage at the right hand node divided by 470 ohms. That includes all of the currents that touch the top center node. We can then write an equation at the top right hand node. The current through the 470 ohm resistor enters the node and the current through the inductor leaves the node. Writing those currents as a difference in node voltages divided by the resistance or an impedance gives us our second equation. Now we're past the circuit analysis point of this procedure we are left with just complex algebra. Unfortunately, the mathematics professors at my institution will tell me that algebra is our weakest point. One of the best ways I can think of to avoid algebraic mistakes is to do as little algebra as possible. I'm gonna begin and end my algebraic manipulation of these equations by pulling out the coefficients that multiply each of the variables. I'm not even going to do the complex arithmetic. As I stated, one of my objectives here is to minimize the number of algebraic mistakes I can make. While it is possible, and actually not that difficult to solve the system of equations by hand, we have tools called calculators that can perform the computation for us. These equations are set up to be put in matrix form. Many different tools can be used to solve the system of equations at this point. That includes several different calculators. 
I'll provide a few links to some videos that demonstrate how to solve complex systems of equations on a few specific calculators. I highly recommend you pause the video right now and try to solve the system of equations using your calculator. This will be a very necessary skill as we move forward. So, it is probably best to attempt it with a simple system of equations. When I put the system of equations into my solver, I get that the phasor voltage VO is equal to 2.019 E to the J 97.84 degrees volts. And V1 is equal to 1.327 E to the J 146.7 degrees volts. I should also point out that I'm playing loose with significant figures at this point. We can get it closer to something reasonable at the end of our calculations. In circuits that have capacitors and inductors, two decimal places may be generous for significant figures. Let us remember that at this point we have only determined the phasor voltage. The original problem was to determine the time-dependent voltage. So we need to take this circuit back to the time domain. Here is the original circuit, and we determined that the phasor voltage across the 1 kilo ohm resistor was 2.2019 E to the J 97.84 degrees volts. One advantage to the polar form of complex numbers is that we already have the magnitude and phase angle of the time domain expression. Remembering that our angular frequency was 5 mega radians per second, the voltage can be written as a magnitude times the cosine of the angular frequency times time plus our phase angle and, of course, our units are volts. With our output voltage expressed in the time domain, this analysis is complete. The only real difference there was between doing node voltage analysis in the phasor domain and doing it on a resistive circuit was the fact that we had the transition between the domains at the beginning and end of the problem. The actual node voltage analysis was identical. We do have to likely learn a new function of our calculator, but the rest of this was really just putting things together that we already knew. Just for fun, let's look at a circuit that has a dependent source. While like most examples, this is a contrived circuit, I would like to point out that the voltage source is the sinusoid that represents the standard wall voltage in the United States. Most often the stated wall voltage is somewhere between 115 volts and 120 volts RMS at a frequency of 60 Hz. This cosine function represents that same signal. The problem is set up so that we are trying to determine the time varying voltage across the capacitor. The current controlled current source is dependent upon the current through the inductor. This is clearly a circuit where sinusoidal steady state analysis applies. So our first step will be to take this circuit into the phasor domain. The pertinent angular frequency is the 376 7 radians per second, so I will write that off to the side. To begin converting the circuit to the phasor domain, we can write the Vx of t as a phasor voltage Vx. We can then write our controlling parameter I0 of t as I0 in both places that it appears. Since our source does not have a phase angle, we can simply write it as a magnitude with a phase angle of zero degrees in the phasor domain. We will have to write the capacitor as an impedance. This is done by remembering that the impedance of a capacitor is one over the complex number times the angular frequency times the capacitance. This results in an impedance of minus J 12.06 ohms. The inductance is converted to an impedance by taking the complex number times the angular frequency times the inductance. This results in an impedance of J 37.27 ohms. With all of the elements converted, we now have our circuit in the phasor domain. The reference node for this problem is clearly identified as the bottom node. We can then highlight the three remaining nodes. The node on the left is connected to the voltage source and will be a potential equal to that of the source. The middle node is our phasor voltage Vx. We will call the remaining node Vo. Continuing our setup for the node voltage analysis, I will define the currents through the resistors as traveling from left to right, while the direction of the currents through the capacitor and the inductor are already defined by existing parameters. Now we are ready to write node equations at the two identified nodes. At the middle node, we have the current through the 22 ohm resistor entering the node. That will be written as 165 e to the j 0 degrees volts minus Vx divided by 22 ohms. That will be equal to the three currents that leave the node. The current through the dependent source of 0.5 IO, the current through the 47 ohm resistor, which is Vx minus Vo, over 47 ohms, and the current through the capacitor, which is Vx minus zero over negative J 12.06 ohms. The right-hand node has two currents entering it, and the current of the dependent source, which is 0.5 IO, and the current through the 47 ohm resistor, which is Vx minus Vo divided by 47 ohms. The current through the inductor is the only current leaving the node. Writing that current in terms of node voltages gives us Vo minus zero over J 37.7 ohms. Since the circuit has a dependent source, 
course, we will have to write the controlling parameter in terms of node voltages. So IO equals VO minus zero over J37.7 ohms. Now we have three equations with three unknowns. Again, I'm going to approach this with the philosophy of doing as little algebra as possible. So rearranging the first equation in order to gather coefficients gives us the following equation. Rearranging the second equation results in this and rearranging the last equation results in this. These equations can easily be written in matrix form as follows. Note that all I have done at this point is to pull off the coefficients from each of the variables without doing any further mathematical manipulation of them. The system of equations is in the form of a 3x3 three three matrix times a column vector being equal to a column vector. If we take the inverse of the 3x3 three three matrix and apply it to both sides, the result is the unity matrix times our unknowns being equal to a column vector of our solutions. So the current IO is equal to 1.987 e to the minus j 106.1 degrees amps. Vx is equal to 87.39 e to the minus j 48.06 degrees volts. And VO is equal to 74.16 e to the minus j 16. 1, 2 degrees volts. I am still being sloppy with significant figures, but that is not the main point of this procedure. Now that we have our phasor quantities determined, we still need to take those back to the time domain for our solution to be complete. We were trying to determine Vx of t. We have the phasor voltage Vx. To convert that back to the time domain, we simply need to remember that the angular frequency was 377 radians per second. We can then take the magnitude and the phase angle and apply them directly to the cosine function. Now we probably got hung up a little bit when it came to solving these complex systems with our calculators, or just when it came to solving the mathematics. Beyond that, the only thing we had to do differently compared to a DC circuit was convert this circuit to the phasor domain. That is the beauty of phasor analysis. By simply switching to complex numbers, we can avoid all the headaches of the differential relationships between current and voltage, and we avoid having to deal with those wonderful trigonometric identities that we learned years ago. To summarize, when we see a circuit with sources that have all the same angular frequencies, we know that we will be able to analyze it in the phasor domain. If the circuit warrants, this can be done using node voltage analysis. All we have to do is convert all our quantities over to the phasor domain, or representation, and then perform node voltage analysis, as we learned for DC circuits. It may take a little bit of practice to learn how to enter complex systems of equations into our calculators, but that time is well spent, as the entire electric grid is a sinusoidal steady state system, and these types of circuits are common. Once we have our phasor quantities determined, we just have to convert back to the time domain to express our final answer. Unless, of course, all we needed to do was determine the phasor quantity. That's all for today. Go out and make it a great one.